This episode is brought to you by Brilliant. In 1954, Soviet rocket designer Sergei Karlov began development of the R-7 Semyorka missile, the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile. Between 1957 and 1961, 28 launches were conducted, leading to the R-7A derivative, the first operational ICBM, that would be fully deployed in 1962. While a modified R-7 would kick off the space race with the launch of the first artificial satellite, Sputnik 1, into orbit, it also demonstrated that it was powerful enough to launch a nuclear warhead against the United States. While the mass use of strategic nuclear weapons is the ultimate terror of modern warfare, it represents the final stage of conflict escalation on the world stage. A more immediate threat comes from tactical nuclear weapons. Tactical nuclear weapons are generally considered low-yield, short-range weapons designed for use at the theater level alongside conventional forces. Both the US and Russia defined a tactical nuclear weapon by its operational range. Land-based missiles limited to 400 kilometers and air and sea launched weapons limited to 500 kilometers are considered tactical under this definition. However, other major nuclear powers such as China consider their tactical nuclear weapons as strategic. In the context of nuclear proliferation, tactical nuclear weapons are far more dangerous than strategic weapons. Many lack an electronic lock or an access control security device known as a permissive action link. In addition to this, their small size drastically increases their vulnerability to theft and unauthorized use. Even within the scope of state use, their battlefield-centric missions and perception as being less destructive encourage their forward basing and can make the decision to use tactical or nuclear weapons psychologically and operationally easier, potentially pushing a conflict into the realm of strategic nuclear escalation. Even more alarming is the fact that tactical nuclear weapons constitute a large percentage of the global nuclear arsenal, making up around 40% of America and Russia's combined nuclear armaments and almost 100% of every other nuclear state. This risk of proliferation and the lowering of the threshold to escalation that tactical nuclear weapons create have resulted in successful reduction efforts between the US and Russia around the turn of the century. However, their appeal as a relatively inexpensive counter to costly advanced conventional forces, as well as the political and military influence many smaller nations believe they yield, has still persisted despite these efforts. Because of this relative ease of access and the lower psychological barrier to their use, Detecting tactical nuclear weapon detonations has become a critical part of military surveillance. Sensing, localizing, and analyzing tactical nuclear detonations are particularly challenging due to their low yields as their detonations can appear as large conventional munitions. Surveillance systems designed to detect these detonations must home in on a telling characteristics of a nuclear weapon. This is accomplished using a little-known mechanism that was devised at the birth of the atomic age, known as a bang meter. The distinctive characteristics of a nuclear detonation were first observed in 1945 at the Trinity test site at the Hornada del Muerto desert of New Mexico. As the very first nuclear weapon detonated, it was observed by both cameras and other optical instruments that a peculiar double-peaked illumination curve of light was emitted from the bomb. It was soon determined from analyzing the fireball expansion phenomenon of the detonation that two millisecond range peaks of light were separated by a period of minimum intensity lasting from a fraction of a second to a few seconds that corresponded to an atmospheric shockwave breakaway from the expanding front of the fireball. This shockwave is known as K-shock and it is composed of an ionized plasma created from the matter of the weapon's outer components and casing. As the shockwave breaks away from the fireball, the opacity of the heated air to visible radiation is sufficient enough to cause absorption of the light from the glowing hot gases of the fireball. This causes a momentary decrease in the intensity of the observed emitted light from outside the shockwave, creating the first light peak. As the shock front begins to cool, it gradually becomes transparent, allowing visible radiation to escape from the hot gases of the inner fireball. This now creates a rise in the observed visible light intensity forming the start of the second light peak. As the fireball continues to expand and increase in surface area, it reaches a point of peak light intensity and subsequently begins to cool. As this cooling occurs, the emitted light once again begins to decrease in intensity, forming the second observed light peak. Beyond simply detecting the nuclear nature of the detonation, 
It was also observed that the time it took for the shockwave front to transition from opaque to transparent was directly correlated to the weapon's yield, effectively allowing a weapon's size to be determined from the time between the two light peaks. In 1948, during the third series of American nuclear testing called Operation Sandstone, the first purpose-built proof-of-concept device for specifically detecting nuclear detonations would be tested. While this device was simple and devised on site, it provided a measurement of light intensity over time using a photocell coupled to a cheap oscilloscope. Timing for the measurement was provided by an overlaid 1 kHz signal. The simplicity and effectiveness of this measurement technique at Sandstone led to Manhattan Project physicist Fred Rhinus concluding that this simple instrument would prove valuable operationally and could conceivably be a dependable method of yield measurement. Shortly after Sandstone, Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory had requested that defense contractor EG&G construct and produce a portable instrument based on the measurement technique. The first operational prototype would be constructed by 1950. EG&G's devices employed blue-sensitive photocells and the necessary circuitry to create and hold a sweep on a small oscilloscope screen with timing marks on it. The scope was then photographed with a Polaroid camera so that a reading could be obtained within a couple of minutes after detonation. During a meeting with the project group, Reynas would coin the term bang meter for the device. This name was a pun referring to the Hindi word bang, an edible preparation made from the leaves of the cannabis plant that is added to food and beverages, producing an intoxicating effect. The implication of the name was that one would have to be on drugs to believe that this simple detector would actually work. Testing of the bang meter would be done alongside subsequent nuclear tests with up to five instruments being used per detonation. A calibration curve was developed from the average of these measurement devices and the testing weapons yield. From this data, the bang meter was able to optically determine a nuclear weapons yield to within 15%. Though blue light was used to produce this initial calibration data due to its higher contrast within the detonation, it was soon discovered that changing the observed spectrum of visible light also modified the amount of time it took for the light intensity to start its initial drop-off. Because of this, a distinct calibration for each color range of the visual spectrum was needed. During further tests, it was also realized that the altitude of a bomb's detonation could be determined from analyzing the time to minimum light intensity as the duration of the initial fireball expansion was largely influenced by the effects of the ground on its shape. Furthermore, it was also observed that the bang meter had the advantage of being able to function with reflected light, making it highly effective even at a distance. A second, more refined version of the bang meter would be developed for Operation Buster Jangle in 1951, and it would soon be adopted as a standard test instrument for a subsequent series of nuclear tests. The Mod 2 bang meter was designed as a portable package with self-contained power. It possessed low power drain characteristics, and it was simple to operate, having only an on-off button and a baseline record button. By the late 1950s, vehicle-mounted bang meters were developed, with the first aircraft-based systems being fitted to KC-135A aircraft in 1961. These aviation-compatible AC-powered systems were specifically designed and deployed to monitor the Soviet Tsar Bomba, the largest nuclear weapon ever detonated. Around the same time, the first large-scale nuclear detonation network would be deployed by the US and the United Kingdom. Called the Bomb Alarm Display System, the network consisted of dozens of bang meter sensors deployed within cities, military installations, and early warning radar sites throughout the North Atlantic. Linked by Western Union Telegraph and Telephone Lines, the system was designed to report the confirmation of a nuclear double flash before the sensors were destroyed by the detonation. The bomb alarm system was in use from 1961 to 1967, and while it offered adequate surveillance for the onset of a nuclear war, the emergence of the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1963 now warranted the ability to monitor atmospheric nuclear testing at the global level. The solution to the challenge of this new scope of nuclear detection came with Project Vela, a group of satellites developed specifically for monitoring test ban compliance. A total of 12 VELA satellites were constructed and were launched in pairs between 1963 and 1970. Orbiting as far as one-third of the distance to the moon, the initial six VELA satellites relied on only 12 external X-ray detectors and 18 internal neutron and gamma-ray detectors for coarse nuclear detonation monitoring. 
By 1965, the final six satellites were built on a further developed variant known as the Advanced Vela Satellite. The Advanced Vela Satellites supplemented their existing detection systems with two fully electronic silicon photodiode based bang meters which monitored light levels over sub-millisecond intervals. They could determine the location of a nuclear detonation to within about 3,000 miles, exceeding the positional and yield accuracy of the original system. During the 1970s, a new satellite-based program would be established that would initially augment and ultimately supersede the role of the Vela satellites. Called the Defense Support Program, this early warning reconnaissance system would field 23 satellites over 45 years, primarily providing early warning against ICBM launches. Defense Support Program satellites were designed to track the intense heat created by missile and rocket motors, as well as explosions, via their infrared telescopes. However, unlike Vela, these satellites were not limited in scope to nuclear detonations and could be used to track both conventional weapons as well as rocket launches. As the Vela program was phased out in the mid-1980s, the task of specifically detecting nuclear detonations would become a part of the new global positioning system. Establishing the first GPS constellation of 24 satellites began in 1978 and became fully operational by 1995. Known as the GPS Nuclear Detonation Detection System, this capability took advantage of the extensive coverage of the Earth's surface offered by the constellation. While the GPS satellite constellation is operated by the United States Air Force, the Nuclear Detonation Detection System on board is both designed and operated by the National Laboratories of the Department of Energy. The system is composed of three key sensors, an X-ray detector, a high-intensity radio wave detector, and a ground station calibrated bang meter. In a nuclear detonation, close to 5% of the energy released is in the form of ionizing radiation. One easily detectable component of this ionizing radiation are impulse x-rays. These bursts propagate from a nuclear detonation in a spherical shell, and by measuring their intensity against the accurate timing information of four or more satellites of the GPS constellation, these timing differences of arrival can be used to calculate the position of the x-ray burst source. In order to reduce false trigger events, three of the satellites in the constellation have their X-ray sensors dedicated to continuous background radiation monitoring. These measure the natural particle fluxes in the Van Allen radiation belt through which the satellites pass through, assuring the proper interpretation of data from the X-ray sensors. In addition to the X-ray sensors, an intense radio wave detector is used to sense the radiation that emerges from the energized electrons produced by the interaction of the primary bomb radiation with the atmosphere. Known as Compton currents, these energized electrons interact with the Earth's magnetic field to produce an electromagnetic pulse, or EMP. Each of the GPS satellites are equipped with a specialized antenna and support system to both detect and measure these EMP incidences. The bang meters that complement the sensors on the GPS constellation are the most sophisticated satellite-based systems to date. Each satellite can continuously monitor their respective Earth disk for a double-peak light event. Each sensor is backed by a digital signal processor system that is capable of monitoring several visible light spectrums simultaneously while rejecting slow-varying lighting changes, as well as transient false alarms such as those produced by lightning, sun glints over water surfaces, and even high-energy particle strikes on the sensor. GPS bang meters are routinely calibrated and validated using a ground-based Ruby laser system located at the Sandia National Laboratory. This procedure involves triggering a detection event on the in-view satellites using a laser pulse. This pulse encodes timing information from a ground station GPS clock, which is used to validate the constellation's ability to determine an event's position. Since its inception, the GPS Nuclear Detonation Detection System has undergone three major upgrades, and at present, it is operated in conjunction with Defense Support Program satellites to form an integrated system known as the Nuclear Detonation System Nuclear Detection System, or NUDET NDS. NUDET NDS not only continuously monitor for atmospheric activity, but also integrate seismic event detectors for sensing underground tests and other anomalous potential nuclear events. A more recent addition to the system has been the inclusion of Nuclear Biological Chemical Reconnaissance Vehicles, or NBCRVs. These carry bang meters within an integrated sensor suite for the purposes of assessing nuclear awareness at the battlefield level. 
At present, the sophisticated network of sensors that monitor the planet make it near impossible to detonate a nuclear weapon without detection and ultimately a response, making the silent capability a crucial element of the defense strategy that keeps nuclear war at bay. The nuclear detonation detection mechanism aboard the GPS constellation relies heavily on its positioning system for localization. Within this system lies an amalgamation of math that must not only trilaterate a position purely on timing information, but also compensate for the complexities associated with operating 24 orbiting satellites and even physical phenomena such as general relativity. Applying mathematical thinking to problem solving is a critical part of engineering and with brilliant reinforcing your mathematical thinking skills to attack design challenges has never been easier. Brilliant is my go-to tool for diving headfirst into learning a new concept. It's a website and app built off the principle of active problem solving. Because to truly learn something, it takes more than just watching it. You have to experience it. With this in mind, Brilliant has been tirelessly revamping their courses to introduce even more interactivity, and with their recently updated Calculus in a Nutshell course, you can expect intuitive and interactive examples that allow you to make sense of these abstract concepts. With Brilliant, you learn in depth and at your own pace. It's not about memorizing or regurgitating facts. You simply pick a course you're interested in and get started. If you feel stuck or made a mistake, an explanation is always available to help you through the learning process. If you'd like to try out Brilliant and start learning, learning STEM for free. Click the link in the description below or visit brilliant.org forward slash newmind and the first 200 of you will get 20% off an annual premium subscription.